if you want to and just make comments either in the chat or respond within any discussion debate. Um, also, please be aware that um, because of HERDA, our NHS colleagues are going to give a statement and be limited in what they're going to say because of the NHS guidance for PERDA. So I just thought I'd tell everybody at the beginning of the meeting because they're thinking, why can't we debate certain issues? But they've been told, they've been given specific NHS guidance that they're limited what they can actually discuss. So some of the items on tonight's agenda will just be what they've short statement of the NHS guidance for PERDA. So I just thought I'd tell everybody at the beginning of the meeting because they're thinking, why can't we debate? Okay, did everyone hear that? It's like I'm hearing myself coming back. Is that okay, Fitzroy? Fitzroy? Hello? Everything's fine, Cheer. Everything's fine. Yeah, it's just I've just heard myself repeating what I've just been saying, so I wasn't sure if that was correct. Okay. That was me just checking on YouTube that you were going live. That's all. All Sorry right, okay. That. Okay, it's okay. Um, Thanks a lot. And as I was saying that what we'll try and do as normal, we'll try and I'll try and have a, um, a comfort break at the end of each hour. So obviously I know that the um, the time for reflections at eight o'clock. So I'll try and um, finish the first part of the meeting about 7.55. So at least everyone can have at least five minutes to include their minute or so of reflection. Because today is obviously um, a year since um, COVID lockdown. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to give due respect to the people that we've lost um, in this last year. So I'll try and do that at 7.55 to about just after eight o'clock so people can include their um, minute of reflection, you know, quietly. Um, as I was saying that if you don't want to be seen on, on camera, you can switch your camera off and still be part of it. Please either um, put your hand up in the raised uh, hand or try and put your hand up and I'll try and bring you into the de any debate. Um, it, I assume that everybody's got a copy of the agenda and all the supplementary um, documents, reports, and minutes from last meeting. Can I just have a yay or nay from members? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And before we start, let's just confirm, I think let's just go around and just confirm which, which members we have tonight. Um, if I start with Councillor Kath Whitton, if you just say who you are and which ward you're from, thank you. Councillor Kath Whitton, uh, substituting for Councillor Bill Williams from the High Ward. Thank you. Councillor David Noakes, please. Good evening. I'm Councillor David Noakes. I'm a Warren Bankside Ward Councillor and I'm also the Vice Chair of the Health and Social Care Scrutiny Commission. Thank you. Councillor Sonny Lamb, please. Um, Councillor Sonny Lamb, member of this um, scrutiny committee. I'm also the um, committee champion for Northeast Multi World from South Bermondsey world. Thank you. Um, Councillor Charlie Smith. Uh, good evening everyone. I'm Councillor Charlie Smith. I represent the Goose Green Ward in uh, East Dulwich. Thank you. And I'm trying to think, is, have I got anybody else? And last but not least, I'm Councillor Victoria Lisa. I also represent the Goose Green Ward Labour member and I'm the chair of this Health and Adult Social Care Scrutiny Commission. Okay, if we have go on to number one in the agenda, it said apologies. I know we've had apologies from Councillor Bill Williams and he's been replaced by uh, Councillor Kath Whittam. And um, I've just been informed that Councillor um, Marie Linford Hall from Lib Dems, unfortunately, sent her apologies. Okay, we go to number two oh, in the agenda. Apologies, Sorry. Chair, just so yes, to interject. Um, I think uh, we normally record uh, projects from Councillor Sandra Rawls as well. Okay, sorry, I forgot about that because it's a long standing thing. I think it's a long standing apologies from Sandra Rule. Mm -hmm. I think she's been long term sick, hasn't she? Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, and go ahead to um, agenda item two. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of if we go on to agenda item two, notification of any business which the chair seems urgent, nothing has come through from any members, the urgent. So we'll go through to um, any declarations of interest on dispensations from any members? No? I think my position remains as notified before, got member family working with, for the London Ambulance Service. Thank you, Councillor Lamb. Thank you for that. That'd be noted. Okay, can we go on to um, agenda item number four, the minutes from the last meeting? That's from the meeting of the 8th of February, 2021. Has everyone had a chance to have a look at that and see if there's any corrections? Because I think anything from that meeting has been brought over forward to this meeting. OK, 
Okay, can we agree that that was an accurate reflection of that meeting of the 8th of February, members? Agreed. Agreed. Agreed? Thank Agreed. you. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, that's been signed off. Okay, we go on to item number five, which is NHS community, um, NHS community commissioning group. This is the this is the one that the original item was picked up from the January meeting. We we're actually originally going to discuss the integrated care systems, the GP practice ownership and recent changes, and the partnership Southwark. But obviously, um, given the NHS um, CCG of centres late notification about the NHS um, guidance for PERDA. Um, they were able to discuss the integrated care systems. What they will do is just um, talk about the GP practices at the ATM, Matics, et cetera. And also um, other colleagues, Sam and Jeanette, will talk about Partnership Southwark. So can I invite um, the representative to talk about the GP practice ownership? I think it's ATM, Matics. Would that be Sam Heppelwhite? Yeah, that's me. Hello. Thank you. Lisa. Um, just to say, um, we have done a pack around the um, ICS white paper, which um, Julie has a copy of, and we will circulate after the meeting. It's, it's, a, it's a very factual uh, account of the white paper, so uh, you will still have that information um, as, um, as members of the, um, the committee. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> with regards to... Um, the AT Medics transfer of holdings to Opros Health. Um, we can confirm that we have um, four practices in um, Southwark that this uh, pertains to. Uh, there are seven across South East London um, and uh, they are all APMS contracts for, uh, for Southwark. Um, they, uh, AT Medics applied to the CCGs across London um, and we agreed that we would do this um, consistently and together so that there wasn't a different approach in the different parts of London to transfer uh, from the directors of uh, 18 Medics to Opros Health, a company that already holds a number of GP contracts and other health service contracts across London in other parts of the country. Um, so all GP practices work under a contract to the NHS, as you are probably aware, whether they are individual GPs or partners or other organisations, um, as in um, uh, AT Medics. However, everybody must meet a very strict standard. So when we go out to procurement of these contracts, um, we have those contractual requirements must be met. Um, and that applies to all providers. AT Medics um, uh, asked uh, permission of the NHS, so basically the CCGs across London for the uh, change in control. So uh, what we are using, as I mentioned, is an APMS contract. So uh, this is a nationally agreed contract. It is not a contract that South East London CCG has um, written. Um, and this is allowed under those terms of the GP contract. Um, we did receive uh, significant uh, legal advice because um, it was something that uh, needed to be uh, clarified. And in this case, the change was approved as there was no legal or contractual basis for the CCG to reject the change in control. So, so uh, that's my statement, uh, Councillor Elisa, um, uh, and I will do my best to answer any factual questions but again I have because uh, obviously you have the papers this has been um, uh, a number of organisations and individuals have written to the Secretary of State uh, highlighting their concerns about it this is obviously now being escalated further than uh, the South East London and the London CCGs. Okay so I assume Sam given your statement you can't take any questions because because unless they're based on fact um you won't be able to take any questions from members i can take questions away um i can do that um yeah. but but unless i can give a factual answer because yeah. this has now gone much further than the ccg it's it's yeah. now um uh, obviously in the in a in a wider political arena okay okay i'll Okay, I'll take the first question from Councillor Noakes, please, because I've got a hand raised. Councillor Noakes. Yeah, uh, and thank you for your presentation, Sam. Um, I mean, 
uh, noting the comment about what you can and can't answer. Um, maybe I can say what I can say because I don't think I'm similarly restricted, I don't believe. Um, I mean, the, I think you'll understand that there are real concerns, I think, from members of the public about, about the idea of American healthcare moving into the NHS. Um, and I say that as someone who has spent a lot of holidays in the US and, you know, there's much that I like about America and uh, the American people. But uh, one of the things I do not, I'm not an admirer of is their, their health system, uh, which of course you can't call a health service because it doesn't uh, actually, uh, it's not a service that's available to everybody and it's not based on uh, need. It seems to be based on your ability to pay. So I think that's the sort of context where people obviously are very concerned about American um, healthcare firms, which are motivated or America is, you know, a lot of parts of, um, of America seem to be motivated by profit. And the worry is that that in some way uh, is going to undermine our own national health service. Um, just, I think, just factually, um, I mean, you, I think what you're saying is that this is the, the, the guidelines that, um, the South East London CCG work to in regards to considering this application are national guidelines and that therefore, um, you know, in a sense, I, I think, well, let me see, I don't know if you can infer, you can confirm this or not, but are, are you saying therefore that you had, you didn't have the ability to reject this application? Uh, I don't know if you can say, answer that question or not. Uh, and the second question is, I mean, to what extent, because I, I suppose the worry is that, that, that American healthcare firms are here to maybe cherry pick the best and most profitable practices and to make money out of them uh, and not necessarily invest back into our NHS. And I mean, does that, would that have the consequence potentially of them deciding who they take on as patients and the sort of service that they offer? So could they offer a reduced service, you know, where they have less staff, et cetera? Um, so do the basics, but not necessarily provide the full service that uh, uh, another GP sur surgery might be providing. Okay. So I can certainly ask answer the first question. <laughs> okay. Um, um, this is a national contract, so the, the clauses of the contract are not for us to change, and that was the basis that we had to make our decision. So we, there was no contractual or legal way that we could say no to this request. Um, to answer the second part of your question, they will therefore have the same contract that other uh, GP practices who have an AP, APMS contract will have and will be expected to meet the requirements of that contract. APMS contracts are slightly different to other contracts that we have with GPs because they are time limited. So uh, they have an end point, whereas uh, lots of the um, GMS is um, general medical services and there is another contract called personal med medical services. They don't necessarily have a, an end date, uh, whereas APMS do. And therefore at the end of that contract, they would then be re-procured as any APMS contract would do, not, doesn't just relate to these group of contracts. Thank you, Sam. Uh, just before I bring in Councillor Witham, um, just picking up from what you just said, Sam, about these are these a APMS contracts are time limited. How long is this contract for the four G GP services with um, this organisation then? Um, so I don't know that off the top of my head, uh, Councillor Lisa, but I can certainly yeah. be, that could be one of the questions that okay. I answer yeah. in the public domain. So it's just yeah. about me finding out. Okay. Uh, there isn't necessarily, there isn't a standard time so it, it, it depends on uh, the, the way that the contract was orig originally let. So there's not like a standard, it's every single contract is 10 years. They might be different lengths, but okay. I, I can certainly find out for the four that we've got in Southwark what the, okay. the end dates are. Thank you. Okay, Councillor um, Witham, please. Yes, I wonder if you can tell me, um, will we see any difference when this, um, contract goes live if it hasn't already and can can they start adding extras into their offer to local people for a fee for example um, 
uh, a bit of nip and tuck, for example. So um, to answer your question is that um, they uh, will be contracted in exactly the same way as the previous um, contract holders. Uh, I can't guarantee that there won't be differences. Um, they are assuring us at this point that there won't be, but um, coming back to the previous point, uh, if the contract lasts for another eight years, I can't guarantee there won't be any different, any changes during that time. Um, the contract is an NHS contract, so no charges can be made to patients providing an NHS service. But could they Thank you. Yeah, go a, supplementary? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Could they set up a little uh, sideline business in the same premises? Uh, so uh, in so it depends on uh, the arrangements they've got in their premises. Um, as with all practices, um, it, it uh, they cannot charge NHS patients for NHS services, but some GP practices uh, or individual GPs um, offer um, additional services, um, it, but not under the NHS contract. So just to be very, very clear, the NHS contract does not allow for charges made to, to individual patients for NHS services. I can't predict what they might want to do. I can't predict what any GPs might want to do. Um, so uh, that, that's a, a, an answer, a question I really can't answer. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Smith, please, you've got your hand up. Thank you, Chair. Um, just very briefly, Sam, would uh, a GP uh, service be able to charge for missed appointments, for instance? I know there was talk about this in the recent years, and is, would that be regarded as being outside of the actual health service? No. So um, if a GP practice cannot charge you for a missed appointment. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thanks for that clarification. Um, Councillor Lamb, please. Yeah, thank you. I think um, my question is, was, uh, was the implication of the US could be contract on our free uh, healthcare access at the point of, um, of at the point of access? No, F free access to healthcare at the point of uh, uh, at the point of contact because um, I think that's the fear of everybody, isn't it? Or most people, I would say. Is not just about um, who delivers, uh, in my opinion, but whether, as we know it, you know, healthcare would be free at the point of access. So that principle, how does that, how, what's the implication of their involvement in the delivery on that principle in our healthcare service? Thank you. Uh, so there are, there, every GP that has a GP contract, uh, has to provide NHS services uh, for free. They cannot charge. Um, and the, the, exactly the same contract that was in place before is being moved over to the new arrangement. So they would still have to offer uh, free at the point of contact NHS services to their registered population. That does not change. So if I just sorry to I just because this is a question I get often asked. Um, so their involvement just on delivery side rather than anything else. It doesn't affect or alter anything we know about how we access um, healthcare at the moment, which is free. Absolutely. Exactly. Thank you. And contractual arrangements. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that confirmation. Um, Stephen Lancashire, please. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks for inviting us back. Members will be aware that we've written a brief brief briefing note on, on three issues which are being discussed under this item. If we just focus on the AT Medics one first, uh, what, I, what, I, uh, what I want to pick up is, um, and I appreciate what Sam and her colleagues are are able and unable to talk about. So I'm gonna mainly direct my points to members, for members to pursue further, not necessarily directly with Sam, but 
but and, uh, and other colleagues from keep our national health service public may also want to chip in i think the um the, the first point that maybe Sam could go away and find more information about that I think members should be concerned and interested about, because this is a very complex matter, is what contracts in G, of all GP surgeries in Southwark, what contracts are under the APMS regime and when will they expire? These are four examples that have been taken over by um, uh, Operos, a, a subsidiary of Centene, this American insurance stroke healthcare company. Um, and I think secondly, what I'd say is this, this is as I think as Sam has alluded to, there, there was at the beginning of this process legal advice taken by London or nationwide because it was seen that by the NHS that so they should be acting in a consistent way. Our concern is, and, and, and this is a becomes a very complicated matter that, that I don't expect members to engage in tonight, but, but we shall be asking um, the CCG, as other CCGs are being asked, what due diligence was taken when those contracts were transferred. And that's one major issue. And I shall be forwarding to members um, through you, Chair, uh, a copy of the legal questions that we now want to ask because as Sam rightly said this is an issue that is now escalating across London and nationwide and and the second um, question that we think is of great concern and should be of great concern to councillors is how is patients data going to be protected there are some clauses or concerns we have about data protection uh, in all this and third, the third point I just want to make, which again will be a, a, a point of contention, I'm sure, and, and debate, but picking up what Councillor Noakes said, what we're worried about in KOMP, and, and, and also, sorry, I think Councillor Whitton made a similar point. What we're worried about, and we think you as councillors should be worried about, is along the line, as Sam rightly says, there's no way of predicting how things will change in the next eight years in terms of the detail. And I would encourage you to think that the devil will be in the detail of this. And what we're worried about is, is there'll be a reduced service. It's not that there'll be charges, but this, this is a profit-making company that's now running these surgeries and they will look to changes. And it may well be in the next four or five years that these surgeries will, will close down because they're not making enough profit for them. And, and that's a great concern to us because it reduces the access of people to, walk to, to their local GP and primary care services. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Stephen. I think that's all been noted. And I think I've even had prior conversations to this meeting with um, Julie, the Democratic officer, that maybe that we may have to bring this item again to another meeting because it's so important because there's so many issues. And, and, I, and I know Sam's and her team are limited in what they can actually discussed tonight so I think it is a crucial thing that may be another standing item for a next meeting. Can I just pick up um, Councillor Noakes because you've still got your hand up or is that a legacy hand? Uh, it's a sort of follow-on questions from my previous okay. one. Okay. Quickly. Um, I appreciate that Sam may only be able to give limited answers but um, so I, I guess well my three questions are one is in regards to the APMS contracts are they are they in the public domain is my first question and then the second one uh, to what extent you can answer these is, uh, I mean, I think as, as Steve was saying, it may not be that they're going to charge people for services, but I guess the worry is, you know, for example, could they be selective in which patients they accept? Could they ask you to fill a form in with your existing conditions and then say, oh, sorry, there's no, no, no availability at this practice. And the other thing that would concern me is about, could they, or maybe this already exists, I don't know. Can they be selective about which drugs they might prescribe and which staff members they make available? So could they, uh, you know, rather than seeing doctors, could you be seeing nurses or things that would in some way save them money in regards to the service that they provide while still obviously remaining legal? Um, so I am going to answer some of those questions in a very high level um, way, which hopefully will give you some answers and um, I will try and answer them 
at a later date. So um, I will get uh, as much information that is in the public domain around the APMS contracts, i.e. The, the, the end dates and the, um, the, that isn't commercially sensitive, um, and I will share that with you um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a group. Um, they, uh, uh, there is, a, a, again, I go back to the principles of the NHS that isn't around any other reason um, you cannot just reject somebody because of uh, their fact that they've got a long term condition or they might be uh, 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 deemed to be a, a um, high need or um, an expensive individual. That is uh, absolutely not allowed as part of any NHS contract. So if that was to happen, that would be a breach of their contract. Um, and the same goes for if there is um, uh, a high cost drug. There are ways for each practice to be able to apply uh, for uh, funding to support high cost drugs uh, through the NHS. And that is a standard procedure. Um, I think um, all practices use their workforce um, in a creative way. So um, there are many more uh, 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 professions in general practice than there used to be 10 years ago so uh, we've got paramedics working in general practice we've got mental health nurses so you won't necessarily in any practice just automatically see a GP or a practice nurse so again I appreciate it's a very high level um, answer but I cannot predict uh, what any practice will do with their workforce and how they will use their workforce. There is a contract that requires them to see patients that are registered with them to look after them. Um, as you know, each of the contracts has, uh, this is again a national arrangement that we have in place, incentivizes um, GPs to manage long-term conditions through the quality outcomes framework. That is in place for every single GP. Um, so, um, I can't tell you how uh, this, the, the new arrangements will work out, but they will be, at, as every other GP practice will be, they will be held to account for delivering their contract. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Is, all right, okay, I've got Irene, just seen your hand up. Go ahead. Um, yes, it's, um, a, a clarification question to Sam, which you may or may not be able to answer this evening. But the PCCC of Cell CCG at their meeting in December agreed this transfer on the basis that AT, APM that they would <clears throat> that 18 medics would still be the APMS contract holder. Um, then in February all the directors of that company resigned and were replaced with um, employees of Oprose and Centene. Will that, does that make a difference? Given that they, they're not the directors, how on earth are they going to be accountable for the contract? Thanks. Um, so I'm sorry, Irene, that was one question I can't answer, answer at this time, but I said, I've, I've written it down. Um, so we definitely will answer that question, but um, it cannot be tonight, but I will get you a written answer to that question. Thanks. Seen another hand. Um, it's me, Chair, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah Stephen, yeah, I'm gonna bring, it, bring, bring in Steve, thank, go thank ahead. You, Chair. Just, sorry, just two further brief points from me. Um, the first one really to you and the vice chair in your role is going off to the JSOP, the Joint Scrutiny Committee that's, that's meeting on the 8th of April. We think this is of a, such a serious matter. You, you and your other colleagues around South East London should be asking for a discussion at, at that meeting, at the JSOP meeting, because as, as again, as Sam is alluded to this is not just a borough issue this is a South East London indeed a London wide issue and some people are concerned about it as a national issue. Uh, the second point I wanted to make was just um, 
to say to all members that you will note that when uh, the chair kindly agreed that we could do a briefing note, we've attached to our briefing note um, a letter that's been going off to the Secretary of State. And I know at least one MP in this borough has, has been asking questions of, of the Secretary of State in this, on this matter. And given that it is such a complicated matter with so many different bits to it, that I'm, it, it will develop over the next month or so. That, and, and I'm not expecting scrutiny members to be aware of all the different nuances that are related to this issue, but it is a very detailed issue, both from a legal point of view, but more importantly, from a healthcare delivery point of view to residents in Southwark. So it is a matter that I, I would encourage you to look at the links um, related to this matter in, in in our briefing report at the end of our briefing report. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome, Steve. Um, if there's no other questions from any other members, um, can we have a report back from Partnership Southwark? Would that be, is that going to be Jeanette or is that yourself, Sam, again? I think that would be Jeanette, isn't it? I think, Jeanette I think Jeanette's here? going to start, yeah. Okay, Jeanette. Welcome. To To some um, focus on stakeholder sorry. engagement with young people. Yeah. So you, sorry, you wanted an update about partnerships so they can engagement with young people? It just said the item is, what I'm looking at is this under number five, which is saying that this item is a follow-up from the meeting on the 21st of January, and we will discuss in those three sort of bullet points, but obviously we can't discuss integrated care systems today. Um, Sam's talked about GP, practice ownership and recent changes and then the bullet point was partnership so that with the focus on stakeholder and community engagement work with children and young people I assume are you going to are you going to talk later on about the slam and cams is that what you're going to do um, so in terms of engagement with um, young people in terms of partnership so that we haven't had any activity since the last meeting okay. um, Sorry, uh, the, the community and engagement work that we've done was prior to the lockdown. Uh, okay. Any of the work has been in relation to supporting children and young people in terms okay. of the pandemic response. Sorry. Right, okay, okay. Okay, so I'm just thinking that. Yeah. Oh, sorry, there's two hands up. Sorry, if I just take quickly Councillor Noakes and then Steve Lancashire, please. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not sure if this is something I got lost in translation, but uh, um, at the last meeting, my understanding was that um, we were requesting and asking that uh, we have a further discussion with the CCG about their structures uh, as they've moved from the Southwark CCG to a South East London CCG and, and about the accountability around the structures and the openness and transparency of the operating arrangements, uh, particularly in regard obviously to how the public and patients engage with those structures. Um, but I don't know if anyone's ready to talk on that or, or whether we're going to have to bring that to the next meeting or not. But that, that was my understanding of what we were going to have at the next meeting or well, at today's meeting rather. Yeah. Um... Yeah, because I think I think we were going to talk about that, but also I think part of that is it's also covered in the integrated care system, how things are going to operate from the local level to um, the national level. But obviously, I don't think Sam can comment on that, can she? Because we'd asked them particular questions about how how things have been so, structured. So, Sam, so the uh, so the ask was around the white paper and the integrated care system, which is why we did the the presentation that you haven't quite yet received, but you will after the meeting. Um, Sorry, I, 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 um, I, I'm not prepared for that that piece, Councillor No, Sorry. Um, no, I think it, I mean I'm not sure. Maybe maybe at our end that we got confused. I don't know, confused, but um, yeah. uh, I mean I still think there is. I think there's still a need for that discussion, but I accept yeah. that it might be able to happen tonight. But um, uh, I think I think that's going to. Uh, Oh, sorry to interrupt. I, th I, th yeah. I agree with you, David. I think that that definitely needs to happen because that was one of the concerns from the last meetings. And I think we're going to have to have another meeting to flash that out, but also drill down on some of the issues that we can't really discuss today because of what Sam said in terms of NHS um, um, guidance with PERDA. Steve, um, you wanted to yes, comment if I or may, questions? Yeah. 
Yeah. I think, yeah. It, I absolutely take the point that there is. You feel there are some things you you can't be be discussing. But in terms of the engagement issue that Councillor Noakes has just raised, which, as you know, and we've written in our <clears throat> both our previous paper and our current paper circulated to members. This is something we're very concerned about. And we've done a fur in uh, at a southeast London level, we've worked on a further briefing paper reflecting our concerns. And I and I will ensure that's circulated um to, to you and all members as a as as a background paper that you can consider when you engage with um Sam and colleagues on the issues of engagement. And I'd be very happy if to circulate that also to Sam so she's aware of what you're receiving but I accept that she can't respond but what I would also say, say chair in terms of the briefing paper we offered to members tonight we I just wanted to draw people's attention to the concerns we had both about the white paper and if I can just leave that paragraph unless people have got questions about it if they can access our paper but the other issue that we you, that you kindly invited us back to talk about was the test and trace issue and that is very current and it's not something that particularly directly involves uh, the CCG because this is a national issue and and what we're really pressing for under the test and trace issue as we have put in our paragraph to members is that members engage um, at whatever level they can at pressing for further resources to come into this borough we're aware that one of the pilot um, models of developing a local test and trace system at borough level, which we think is absolutely essential, rather than wasting money on multinational, uh, uh, multinational companies, which this government has done. It, 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 one of the models for this is Lambeth Council and the neighboring borough. But what we're not clear about is whether Lambeth have actually been given any extra money. And given the pre although we're asking you to press for a locally run test and trace system, we really don't think you can do it unless you equally press uh, government for more resources to carry it out. You will know better than I the kind of pressures you're under because central government is not handing over enough resources for you to do work effectively. But particularly in this area, in relation to COVID-19 and the need for an effective test and trace, we will not get out of this lockdown or these restrictions unless we have one that is locally run at a borough, borough level by the directors of public health and adequately resourced. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Steve. I was actually going to bring you in to do your presentation now because it seemed to oh, flow I'm, naturally I'm, in there. <laughs> sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I've done it. <laughs> if, if, no, I was going to say, is there any comments from any members? Because because obviously I've got three. When I read your briefing earlier on and reread it again earlier on this afternoon, it, for me, it's three key areas about test and trace, AT medics, but also the white paper on health and social care. But last but not least, management of GP services. That's how I read it. And I thought you'd going to have a quick snapshot of each of those areas. But I think you've covered that in a sort of okay. roundabout way, haven't you, really? Yeah. Sorry, I, um, I just, I sorry, I was a bit worried that we were going to no, move on. Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank I know you. I'm doing, Steve. <laughs> I was going to come ask you if you wanted to add in more. Um, does any members want to add any comments or questions or, because I assume that all members have read the briefing papers that Steve had sent. Irene, please. Uh, she's mute. Irene, you're mute. You're on mute. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to make a few points, if I may, Chair, about the relationship between these three areas, because I, <clears throat> I think we can, there's a danger in just taking things as separate and individual items. Um, the way I look at it is that these things together represent a direction of travel for the NHS, which is profoundly problematic. Um, essentially, there's more and more centralisation, and I think you can see that in each of these, these areas, and also a push for bigger and bigger organisations, which are more and more removed from local populations. I think there's um, an increased push for the private privatisation of services or for involving um, private companies, both at the strategic level, 
within um, the national level um, and advising the integrated care systems. And then we've got the private sector in the GP services. And there's also, a, I think, a, a lack of transparency or a hurriedness about making decisions so that the white paper goes out just before Christmas in the middle of a pandemic with not an adequate time for consultation. Um, and then we, we have the CCG process of decision-making. I've been through the, the CCGs across London and they've all made decisions in a different way. Many of them have actually done it through chairs action. And in fact, some of them are not haven't completed the process yet. So I think there's a need to be clear that although these things are individual, they all, we're also um, facing the fact that there is a bigger change being sponsored of which these are bits. Thanks, Chair. Chair, Put myself on mute as well, to be cool. Um, does anybody else <laughs> want to add comments or any other questions at, at this time? Thank you. OK, so can we note what's been said? But also, I think there's a lot of takeaways from Sam coming back to us with some factual information, but also maybe it might be a case if we have to have another meeting next month to actually drill down some of the things that we couldn't discuss tonight, because I think it's really quite important because this has been like a running theme about the, the mergers and, and the key changes locally and across the six boroughs and then nationally as well. And, and we as a scrutiny commission, we feel that we need to discuss that. Um, Councillor Noakes, you've got, you raised your hand again. Uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, no, the only other point I was gonna make is, um, I, I agree with you the, the need to, um, to have a meeting as soon as we can on these items, but, um, I guess we're going to still be caught out by Erda um, until uh, until after the May elections. So mm. we might. I don't know. I don't know how much we're going to pro progress these items until Erda is over. Yeah. Um, it's a shame, a shame, really. I yeah. don't know. I'm not sure what the way around that is. But. Yeah. I'm thinking yeah, that um, as well. Just, just, just to confirm that um, Erda will be in place until the sixth of May. So. If you did want to delve more into integrated um, sort of integrated systems and uh, care systems, then you would need to wait until after the mayor elections. Mm. It's a shame, really, because we got potato now. Yeah, thank, thanks for that confirmation, Julie. I think that that's what we're probably going to have to do. Um, is there any other comments or whatever? Because if not, we can move on to um, Julie's. Anybody report about item six, the SLAM, the CAMS report? on equality of access to, to SLAM and children mental health services. Is that Jeanette? Or that's just, you've, you're, you're on mute. Harold. It's Harold. You've got to oh, take the Maudsley to uh, speak to the paper that we shared. Shall yes, we, please. Uh, shall we yeah, can I just confirm everyone's got that paper? I think it was the, um, looking at the access. Um, so just to confirm, Chair, that that was um, provided um, a couple of days ago. So I did put it okay. on the invitation, but okay. it wasn't actually published with the agenda. Um, okay. Some people might have picked that up, but um, yeah, it was mainly given um, to me by Harold, I think, to facilitate okay. sharing it at the meeting. But um, yeah, so I'm not sure, Harold, did you want me to um, share the publication or is that something that you wanted to screen share? Um, oh, I, I, I can give it a go if you're able to and are, are expert in it, that would be fantastic. Yeah, uh, I can yeah. put that up, yeah. And would, just before we go onto the screen, would it be helpful if the four of us just introduce ourselves, so? Yeah, that would be good. Um, just Harold, just to say that it's, it's 7.46 now, I'll give you about 10 minutes, and 10 then minutes. what we'll do, we'll, we'll close at sort of um, 7.56, let's everyone have the, the, uh, the comfort break, including the minute of reflection, and then we'll come back at five past eight to discuss it further. Okay, so just to give you that sort of heads up like 10 minutes before we have a comfort break. Okay, so okay. I'm Harold Benison, I'm the service director for CAMS at the, at the Maudsley. Um, and then Mary Land is, is with us. Hi, I'm Mary Land, I'm the equality, CAMS Equalities and Diversity Lead. Thank you, and uh, Janet is with us. Yeah, hi, I'm Janet Grimes, I'm the Southwark CAMS Service Manager. And Brenda as well. And hello, I am Brenda Bartlett. I'm Deputy Director for SLAM CAMS. 
Okay, and Mary Lan's going to speak to the presentation. So if you are able to pull that up, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Is that showing okay? Not behaving itself, is it? No. no. Okay, sorry. Just uh, bear with me. <clears throat> sorry about this. Do you want me to have a go or do you think it's... Uh, <laughs> I did a practice earlier and it seemed fine. Um, yeah, I'll have one more go. <laughs> Can I make a suggestion? I think it's coming up to 7.50 now. Oh, oh, okay, great. It's working, great. It's by magic. Okay, Mary, Mary, thank you. Okay, thanks. So um, we're delivering on equality of access to slam cam services. Next slide, please. So we'll be looking at what CAMS is doing to improve equality of access what CAMS is doing about ethnicity data and what the data is saying. We'll touch on opportunities and challenges and conclude on the background and context. So what is CAMS doing to improve access for BAME young people? In addition to our overarching focus on reducing long waits and increasing access to our services, CAMS have also prioritized increasing access for Asian and black young people by 25% by March, 2023. So work to deliver this in 2020, 21, we've successfully established equality leads in every borough and also continue to encourage equality champions in every team. Now, this is very important to us because in CAMS, we want every, all our staff and especially our frontline staff to engage with the CAMS commitment and also to have the equalities topic on every team meeting in our in camps. That way we've been able to generate change ideas and innovations, which we have shared with our senior management team for support to implement. So we can confidently say that the improvements that we're beginning to enjoy in camps is bottom up and not the other way around. And therefore we can fairly say that it will be sustainable. We've also established anti-racist forums and reflective spaces in CAMS. And that's giving us the opportunity to have the very difficult conversation on anti-racism and passive aggression and what that looks like and its impact on people. We've also done co-production with young people on cultural competencies training and engaging black and Asian communities. And it's been a joy actually to see the young people co-lead and also facilitate these trainings. And um, in doing this, the young people themselves have improved their experience in camps. And given that they live in communities and the word of mouth is very important and powerful, we know that they will continue to share their experience in the community and that can help improve access. We also have quarterly monitoring of ethnicity caseload data on our service users accepted and seen in camps. We also have 
Diversity in Recruitment Champions Program in CAMS, and we're delivering the workforce race and equality standards in CAMS. Now, this DIR um, program is very important because what it means is that we've got specially trained Black and ethnic minority staff, and we have them represented on interview panels for all recruitment in Agenda for Change, Band 7 and above. And that way we hope that we can be as transparent and as fair as possible. In addition to that, we've also got planned activities to collaborate with community groups representing BAME communities, and also to improve the way CAMS communicates about race and equality. We have plans at the moment to publish CAMS newsletter on race and equality, which we will share <coughs> Uh, referrers, especially schools. The trust is also implementing PICREF, which is the Patient and Carer Race Equality Framework, which is to address race inequalities across the trust. And this is also being done in partnership with communities. And I must say that CAMS is very much engaged in this PICREF process. And uh, we hope that through that, we can increase access. Um, the slide, can you minimize the font size ever so slightly, please? Um, we've also got recruitment, um, CAMS recruitment uses Black and Asian um, network as well. When we, when we put out our, our recruitment advertisements, we engage the Black and Asian network so that we can have um, people applying from that network as well. Next slide, please. What is CAMS doing to improve ethnicity data? So we currently have ethnicity data matters campaign, which includes delivering improvements in re recording ethnicity. I've highlighted Rishon's video on YouTube, and this is very important. This young lady shared her experience on the importance of having the ethnicity conversation. I recommend it. If you haven't seen it, please watch it on YouTube. It's very informative. Uh, we also have monthly monitoring of CAMS ethnicity recording performance at trust monitoring performance and quality meetings. And I'm happy to say that SADC actually have met the initial target of 95% um, ethnicity recording and continue to improve. And we've got that on the next slide. We've also created dashboards to make the data collection, uh, the, the data collected in our service easier for staff to access and analyze. And we think this is very important because when staff can access the data and more than that, actually understand the narrative or the story behind it, they are able to engage with the changes that is expected of them. So that's something that we're very proud of. And we also continue to publish our annual equality information on CAMPS community services in each borough. This we've actually done for the past four, five years, which means that every year we look in the mirror to see what is changing and also to be able to improve them. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Oh, that is the dashboard for SADOC's ethnicity recording, showing 95.7%. Next slide. Opportunities. So there are opportunities to learn through SADOC engagement and involvement groups and activities, including other providers, and opportunities to work in partnerships with our referrers, especially GPs and schools, to remove barriers in the systems, for example, to think about what support will be needed for our referrers to when they complete their referrals to make sure that ethnicity information is provided on the forms. Also, we continue to work in partnership with other providers like the Nest, Sadak, and Kuz. We continue to develop a diverse CAMS workforce who are supported to flourish at SLAM and to have pride in the services they deliver. And by that, what we mean is that we're supporting our BAME staff within CAMS, um, upskilling them and supporting them to progress to senior positions within CAMS. And that way they will be more confident and will be happier to share their experiences with others. We continue also to focus on staff access and analysis of existing data. Across CAMS and with partners, we develop new ways of working in prevention and early help approaches <clears throat> across our communities. So all this we're doing in addition to our relentless focus on long waits and overall access to specialist CAMS teams. Next slide, please. 
So all these improvements that we started working on is in the background of slum ethnicity recording challenges, which include absent ethnicity data in referrals, administration issues, systems usage and training of clinicians, as well as barriers to BAME young people accessing camp service. And some of the factors include, as we all know, stigma, personal, family and cultural and community issues and concerns, potential barriers in referral routes to camps, and then potential issues at slum camps. And by that, I mean that our clinical staff do not reflect the populations that we serve. And so these improvements that we've started working on is in the background against um, these points that we have raised. So in camps at the moment, we continue to look at race equality, to think about race equality and take actions to improve access experience and outcomes for our BAM service users and our BAM communities. Thank you. Any questions? Thank, thank you for that presentation. Um, is, it, is it Melanie, isn't it? Maryland. Um, Maryland, sorry. Thank Maryland. you. Um, I think what we can do is we're coming to nearly eight o'clock now. I've seen your hand up, um, Councillor Lamb. Um, I think what we should do, we should have a five minute break now, comfort break, that includes the minute for reflection at eight o'clock. Everyone can switch their cameras off. And if we come back at um, 20.03, then we can pick up the questions from Sunny and the rest of the members. Okay, thank you.
Hello, is everybody back? Um, Councillor Lam, do you want to answer your, ask your question to um, is it Marilyn? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me? Because I've taken yes, off yes, my... I can. Yes, I can. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. I've got. Um, I think I've got three questions. First of all, I want to thank Maryland and the team for you know for sharing that such very detailed um, information about where, how far they've travelled, and also where they want to, where they intend to go with their with their plan. Um, my first question is um, um, is relation to the 25% um, access, which is being projected to at, by 2023 uh, for the Black Asian Minority Ethnic Community. Um, what is the situation at the moment? How many people have access so far? And what's the baseline before you decided that, yes, we're projecting by 2023, we're going to increase by 25%. That's my first question. And then my second question in relation to um, access to, to your services. So how many people have accessed your services in the past 12 months? Um, especially because I see all these, um, you know, um, 20, you know, these um, numbers, in, when I'm reading the document, I see all these numbers for um, the proportion in terms of fraction, but there's no number to it how you got those, you know, fractions, you know, so I want to know. And then my final question, which is the third one, is um, what proportion of your senior management are from the Black, Asian and ethnic minority community? And, um, and because obviously um, the service users, if they are not represented in decision making, then um, how we actually serve them or serve them better can be affected um, if they don't have a say in how the services are run. So I'm interested in knowing, knowing that. I know they are very long-winded questions, <laughs> but please Thank if you can answer. Them. Thank you. If, yeah. if, if Harold and his team can answer that quickly. Right I'll just pause in case anyone else. I don't know who's, whoever in your team is best to answer that. So Would that be a combination I, of three? I'll just give a general overview because okay. um, I, I, I can't snap all the numbers out of the air just like that. Um, I, I think um, Janet will be able to give a closer number for Southwark, but broadly... Um, we, we usually hold a, a caseload. I know Southwark is slightly larger because of the investment we have from the council and the CCG, uh, but across the four boroughs, usually our caseload is in the order of 2,000 young people. Uh, I think the Southwark rate might be just a little higher than 2,000. Um, remember that, that what, one of the reasons that makes the answer hard is that on times we're looking at the SLAM component, so the South London and Maudsley component of provision, but more and more what I'm looking to do is move us to a population approach. So we're thinking how we're meeting the needs of young people, whether they've been referred to the Maudsley, the Nest or any other partners in the system. Um, Cause we know with CAMS, one of the issues is, is access. And, and of course the national aspiration was only for 35% of the need to be met. But, but broadly, if you want a round number in your head, um, I think 2,000 wouldn't be too far wrong. I'm just going to pause in case Janet wants to zoom in with a more correct number. Yeah, I think it's that's right, Harold, and it's about 150 referrals approximately a month. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. So um, if I then move on, and I've, I've just eyeballed the uh, chart. So looking at the current ethnicity data, around 50, if, if, I, if I do it in reverse order, around 50% of um, our activity is registered uh, against a white uh, ethnic uh, registration. So that's, that's broadly the number. And then we've got the components and you can see those uh, in, the, in the slide pack. So as we 
grow by 25%. It's that proportion um, to, to come closer in line to the, to the uh, breakup in uh, Southwark. And we're doing this, we're doing this as Maryland alluded to, we're looking at this in each area. So of course, there'll be slightly different, um, slightly different demographics in each, each of the four boroughs that we look at. And then you asked the question about senior staff. Um, so if, and, and, and I think there are two, two things. One is, uh, if I just think of, of core management teams, um, and on what I would consider the senior leadership group um, for the directorate, um, it's broadly it's 10, 10 people and one person uh, is from a uh, black and uh, Asian and minority ethnic background. Um, when you look into the broad definition of senior, um, you will find that there are differences between different professions and groups. Um, I can't give you the number direct off the top of my head, but part of the reason why we brought the staff uh, aspects into something which is designed to help us improve the service that we offer to young people is that we know that we've got a lot of work to do uh, on the staff side as well. And that's represented in, in uh, the whole trust. Uh, so it's probably a theme that you're aware of uh, in any case. So I'm sorry, I can't give you precise numbers, but does that address? <laughs> thank, let me thank you. Um, Chair, can I just ask one yeah, you know, quickly, follow up yeah, question? Quickly. I mean, I do, I do appreciate, um, you know, sometimes it's not really where we were yesterday, um, even though it influenced where we find ourselves today. However, what is important is where we find, project to find ourselves tomorrow and day after. I think that's what is important. So what I probably would like to see, um, do you have any plans, because you said one out of 10, you know, the senior, senior management teams actually one from SA minority, but yet almost 50% of the, of the survey users are from the SA minority. You can see this proportional representation there. So what I would like to see, or what I will ask you, is there any plan in motion that we ensure that the service users define, they see themselves senior management, um, you know, um, representation in future. So Thank yeah, you. yes, absolutely. And if I, if I just, um, I, one of the examples, this is instituted at the trust level rather than, so CAMS as well, but across the whole trust is reverse mentoring. So that there is some, some specific actions to, um, just change the thinking, reset that mindset, um, so that so that there there are greater insights behind the actions and and the earnestness for change, um, and and then obviously what's happening at the trust level, we're looking to absolutely be exemplars in in, in CAMS, um, and and I think one of the areas that's particularly interesting in CAMS is of course we're we're directly involved with, with young people who are making decisions about their future careers. Um, so so we, we've got that sort of double impact that we can have to, to change the story. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, um, Councillor Witham, and then Councillor Noakes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just looking at that statement um, that you're going to increase by 25% by March 2023. Does that mean by 2023 you'll be act, um, helping roughly 2,500 children and young people? That specifically, that reference is to um, is to the uh, ethnic breakup or breakdown of the population that we serve. So it's that is an intention to have a better balance to reflect the Southwark population. Equally though, there is continued focus on CAMS. Uh, and again, the key point there is we're less interested in saying SLAM will see another two and a half, another 500 people. What we're more interested in doing is setting the broader children's services. So, so whether they're seen by the Maudsley in collaboration with the third sector, we have the Nest as an example in Southwark. So there will be, there will be both a growth in the uh, demographic breakdown and there will be uh, an increase in the number of young people seen. So nationally, the long-term plan for the NHS 
is that there will be 345,000 additional young people. That's in the age range of zero to 25 seen. Uh, and that's the long-term plan running 18, 19 through to 23, 24. So by March, 2024. Okay. So that number then cascades down into different areas and there'll be a, a calculation uh, that, that Sam and Jeanette will have for the, for the Southwark plan. Thank oh, you. Okay. I'm glad you asked that question, Kath, because I was thinking, was it just a Southwark specific one or was it all more broader? Um, Councillor Noakes, please. Thank you and uh, thank you to everybody for the presentation. Um, I just wondered, um, so obviously you've talked about the 25% the target um, by March 2023 and I think a lot of the sort of things you mentioned seem to relate to sort of the accessibility and raising awareness I guess of, of the service to all communities but I just wondered if there's any um, research or evidence base in regards to what the need is amongst different communities and whether some communities have higher levels of need than others. Uh, is there anything that informs the issues around access in that, in that sense or not? Or is it just believed that uh, the need is equally spread amongst all ethnic groups? No, there are a number of reports. So again, I just want us to hold, to hold two thoughts in the response. One is looking at the proportion of referrals that are made into CAMS. But of course, by that point, you're talking a smaller and smaller subset. So the other is looking at the prevalence in the broader community. So you've got two populations that we're considering. And certainly as we look at the national um, investigations by NHS Digital, there are a, there are a number of ways it's cut. And, and it certainly would appear that in certain areas, there are differences uh, according to ethnicity. Now, what I think, this is one of the things that we're looking to work with with our, our academic colleagues in, in King's College uh, University, um, is that what we're trying to unpick is how much of that is because there is a, a difference, how much of that is that difference um, and, and then what are the causes behind those differences and how much of that is people just disengaging with a system that they don't believe in. Um, other examples of difference as well that, that sort of build up to the complexity is looking at the differences in regions anyway. So for example, London as a region, this is something I've been looking at in our, our crisis work. So this is a general comment rather than specific to, to the presentation, but. London has a lower proportion of admissions for self-harm. Now, I don't think that is because London has less self-harm. I think it is London has different systems and mechanisms within community services to avoid admission. And so we're beginning to sort of pull at the strands and unpick that information. So it is available nationally, it's available publicly, um, but we don't have, I don't have the ability to give you some sort of cause and effect and some consequences, but it, it's, it's certainly part of the thinking. Okay. Okay, thank you. Do, do you have a supplementary question, David? Just, I can see the thinking, no? Okay. No, well, okay. no, I, well, no, no, because I'm hanging on a little one. <laughs> you, can you can ask the supplementary question. If no, you, no, if no, no, go that. ahead. Uh, no, I, I don't know that I do, Chair. I mean, I, I suppose I just wanted to understand um, that we were addressing both the sort of equality of, of access as well as the quality of need, I suppose. And I just yeah. wanted to be sure that that was factored in uh, into the thinking in regards to when they're setting the target around around increasing um, uh, the potential of, of Black and, and BAME uh, yeah. service users. Um, but I, I think I think it is, so. Okay, because I was going to make a suggestion that um, um, given the list of opportunities that Marilyn was talking about, that we use that as part of our recommendations for our health inequalities, because our second report will be on health inequalities in terms of BME, young people, and mental health. Just thinking that we could start that as a basis of some of our recommendations so we can actually come back and monitor in terms of access to provision of CAMs, but also see if some of those opportunities, some of those things have actually slowly started um, producing the results that you want, because it's good to have opportunities. However, it's our role, I think, as scrutiny to check to see whether they're actually effective opportunities or they're just 
pie in the sky, really. We need to drill them down and say, are they actually working effectively? Are they actually increasing the access of BME young people to your service? And are all these different interventions actually making an impact? Because there's Absolutely. no point having all that and then it doesn't have an impact and you think, well, why did we do that? And I think it's important that we start that and put that as a set of recommendations in our Healthy Inequalities Report, working with young people. If there's no other comments from members, um, thank you for the report back from Harold and your team. And I don't know if J Janet or Brenda. Brenda would like to comment. Um, I was just right. gonna add that. Janet, do you um, add to that? I don't know if you yeah, want to add there was, to that. No, there was just one thing when you mentioned the Health Inequalities Project. There is a multi agency health inequalities project where we're working closely with the NEST and COOS and our local borough partners, um, looking at the positive practice audit tool and so identifying areas where we do need to improve. So it's a, it's a wide scope of, of work. Um, not just focusing on numbers, but actually thinking about things like culturally adapted therapy, what therapy mm. we're offering, particularly young people with different needs. So, yeah. This. Is, is, is that an ongoing project then? Or is mm, that yeah. talented? Yeah. Maybe if we can try and I don't send us synopsis or summary of what you've done so far because it because that because obviously we, we focused on health inequalities that might feed in because some of the questions we're going to ask you might have answered it already and say we've already thought about that and this is what our suggestions and we could feed that into a report to report back to cabinet to say the report um this review has already been done here's are some of the key strands that we we recommend that we should follow through and support either resourcing or whatever going ahead to make sure that the health inequalities are being dealt with in a systematic way and we can report back and cabinet and the council can report back and say let's just check back in six months a year's time or two years and see whether that's been effective does that make sense yeah, yeah. so it's a project being led by the local authority so Jeanette might um, okay okay well, Jeanette. so we are a partner within the, the project okay being led. yeah maybe I'll put that back to Jeanette then is Jeanette still there I don't know if Jeanette's still on the call. Yes, I'm still here. All right, sorry. Item. sorry. I just can't see it. Okay. Okay, well, maybe if I throw that back to you, Jeanette, and say, well, maybe if you go summary of that. I mean, that feeds into number... Are you going to report back on number seven, the equality data, BAME children and young people? Yes, that's correct, Councillor. Yeah, okay, so that's a segue straight into that. Then. Yeah, okay. but it's, it's a lovely segue from Janet, <laughs> actually, um, uh, because... Um, the um, so first and foremost, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the document because you've had it in advance and it's, it's mainly numbers, but I just wanted to provide some context and the context uh, Janet has helpfully started with actually, in that um, uh, Julie asked us to update some information that we had shared with you prior to lockdown with Ross, um, from who was the former um, MD for um, CCG. Um, and uh, so this is the more up-to-date information with now NEST information included in it. Um, the reason why we were able to provide this information quite quickly uh, is because of the work that uh, the Joint Commissioning team are leading with partners from across the system to look at uh, um, uh, equity of access uh, and what we could do to make sure that we were reaching all sections of our communities. And uh, I think probably the important thing to say, as, as Janet says, is this is very much about um, working together across the system, sharing good practice. There are other initiatives that we're thinking about in terms of, for example, how we manage the transition um, um, between um, 18 year olds in terms of CAMs and adults. And we've had a really good session, multi-agency session around that as well. So I, th I think the strengths of the information that you have here is that we have been listening to com the commission. So you'll notice that we are trying to think about how we can clearly capture specifically the Latin American community. So that's a piece of work that we're thinking about how we can do that together. Um, there are some limitations for colleagues that um, are not necessarily solely and wholly focused on Southwark, but we're, we're working through uh, how we um, address that. Um, you can clearly see that there are some real differentials between the different um, organisations at the moment. Um, and we need to think about whether some of this is about not just necessarily uh, the users of the services as to whether they disengage or not, because as you can see, there are very different experiences in terms of the access. 
but also think about practice, think about perhaps some unconscious um, uh, bias that may be leading to some of this, uh, and also think about how we um, actually reach out to the communities as well. So some organizations seem to have quite innovative approaches to really ensuring that people turn up for appointments. Um, I have to say, I think the digital um, shift um, has made a real difference in terms of um, not having um, do not attend, that has reduced it in some ways. Uh, but there's lots of, um, I think what's helpful is, although this is a short paper, it has generated a lot of rich conversation across all the partners working on mental um, well-being and mental health. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, is there any comments? Oh, okay. Um, Councillor Lam, please. Yeah, firstly, I want to thank Jeanette for, for the report. I just have one question. Um, looking at the, um, the tables uh, presented, um, I just realized white and black seems to be disproportionately represented in terms of um, those who are men affected with mental health. Are you able to shed some light on that? And why is the case? What's the response for that? So um, I, I, I would draw your attention to the graph towards the bottom of the table where we look at the actual school population. Mm -hmm. um, so we have quite a young borough and in terms of um, uh, our population, 31% of our population are white and 43% are black or a black British. Um, and so once you look at the bottom um, uh, column, uh, sorry, the bottom row, uh, mm -hmm. where we see that particular split, and then look at the different services in terms of how that is represented in terms of those using the services. Hopefully that's a better representation rather than thinking about over-representation um, generally between, in, within those populations. What we would expect in a very crude sense is that there would be a general um, similar um, spread of use uh, within the population in each service that's not reflected here at the moment and we need to understand why and how we can make a difference and we think we we think we've got some preliminary thoughts about what the difference the differences are um, but we need to do more work this is very much at this um, um, beginnings of a discussion between the different organizations uh, thank, I think that actually leads me to the follow-up question, which you just touched upon, because it seems, does that mean we we need another piece of work to understand why, we, you know, they both groups are disproportionately represented? Um, because this is a big issue that we should be looking at. And so how I, do we do that? So I, I, would, um, I would say it's not necessarily a different piece of work. I think it's the same piece of work that's ongoing. So this is the start of a conversation rather than a one and done. So we've not just looked at the information and um, separated, as I think as Janet indicated, we're thinking about what can we share in terms of best practice, test out and keep monitoring it. And I think, I think to your point um, in terms of the, the commission, you're very clear that you want to see progress and so does the working group that are looking at this. So this is very much an ongoing piece of work where we would sit, like to see over time that the spread starts to reflect in each of our services where appropriate, um, a reflection of the school population. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Janet. Is there any other questions for members? Okay. Um, oh, thank you for that. Hang on a minute. I just lost my page. If we go on to... Um, and Janet, I, I suppose you're not going to comment on the schools' ex exclusions and managed moves. That's slightly different. That was just a briefing paper we got from another scrutiny commission. Yes, that, that oh, um, yeah. yeah, sorry, just to interject here, um, uh, that wasn't from Jeanette, that was from- That's um, from Peter Babudi? That was, no, that was actually um, from Jenny Brenham, who's okay. um, assistant director in, in more the education sort of um, side. Uh, yeah, so it wasn't from Jeanette, although obviously I don't, I mean, yeah. Jeanette may be able to make a comment on that, but that definitely was from a different, the council and it was um provided for information but if people do have any questions um, yeah. I, 
can take that away. Yeah, I don't know if any council uh, uh, members got any questions about the separate paper. Sorry, my apologies um, on schools exclusion managed moves because that was just a quick snapshot of how school, school exclusions were permanent and fixed exclusions right across the piece, right across the um, 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 uh, um, uh, ethnic minority and you know and the white population for Southwark across over the last sort of three four years. So I don't know if there's any comments. Anybody wants to make any suggestions or just comment on that information? I mean, if I could just um, make a few comments, Chair, mm -hmm. if you wouldn't mind. Um, I mean, the bottom line is um, they haven't been in the classroom in the past. Sometimes the the, the teachers have reasons to um, exclude certain students from the classroom if they believe they are extremely disruptive, not that not to disrupt others. Now, but how we manage it is the issue because if we remove that child or those children out of the classroom because we see them as being disruptive, then is another problem for tomorrow, as we've seen in um, antisocial and all the other issues we, we all witness today. And one of the things which we did um, um, some years ago when I was a school governor in certain schools to, okay, sometimes instead of excluding them permanently, we give them short-term exclusion at the same time put support around them. Or you may find some extreme, extreme cases where it's difficult to to bring that person back in. What do we do? I think this is a conversation you probably need to have in future. In those situations, what do we do? What kind of provision? Maybe it's a cry for help. Even sometimes we say they are destructive. Maybe they cry for help. Maybe the kind of provision we have is not suitable for them. So therefore, what kind of situation that we tap into to their Latin skills and talents that is there that they can use different way. We then see some of these excluded ones who then you know, go on and do better in future. So I think we are missing something. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you for that, Councillor Lamp. But also if you look at the paper about schools that can manage moves, some schools have started thinking about what's the alternative provision. It's not either sending them to pupil referral unit because most schools have got on-site behavior unit anyway. What people have started doing is maybe manage moves rather this school isn't appropriate for them. Let's do a managed move to another school. But I think it's a whole school approach and obviously there's alternative provision. There's a lot of other support we can give, give young people. I mean, some schools have still got mentors and learning mentors and you know you know even place to be in other agencies who can support them as well but what we have to do is keep an eye on that and make sure that um if children are excluded for school they don't you know is it for mental health is it for um distress and whatever look at the, the child as a holistic rather than just oh they've been excluded from school and that's it let's not think about it there could be mental health issues there could be family issues that impacted on their behavior at school and I think it was important that we started looking at school exclusions it's good that you could see the rate for Southwark was gradually going down slightly and follow the national trend but we, we should still not be complacent and think well okay what more can we do as as Jeanette was said all the different agencies together to support the the young person isn't it to keep them in school and if they don't keep them in school what's the alternative to make sure they don't completely drop out of the net okay if there's no other comments from that can we move on to item eight which is about e-cigarette safety but Julie I don't know if, could sorry. I ask if it's helpful for those from, from the Maudsley to stay on or I don't know if I just check if any of the members have got questions for um the SLAM team and Maudsley you know, they could leave. Sorry, because I don't want to take up more of your time. Okay, there's no other questions. Thank you for your presentation, Harold. We appreciate that. Thank you very much for having Thank me. you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. I don't know, Julie, if there's any anyone to present the the e-cigarette safety um, thing, or is it just for our, for our information? I think more than anything, isn't it? Can't hear you on mute. Apologies. Uh, yeah, that is somebody expected. Uh, Farah Hart. Um, I am here. Yeah, is here. Yeah. Oh, hi, Farah. Hello. So, as, as you said, the report is for information as it was requested um, by the Commission. Um, hopefully it's self-explanatory, but I'm quite happy to take any questions that you have. Okay. Is any questions for members? I think it is quite straightforward. I found it. Any questions? 
Can I just ask? Chair, can I just ask yeah. something? Very yeah, briefly. go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm no expert uh, in this, but I just wonder, um, in all um, council buildings, um, NHS buildings, are, are these e-cigarettes banned from use? Does so anyone know? So there's not a, uh, a consistent policy across between the NHS and, and um, the council. I think generally we don't allow any sort of vaping inside buildings anyway, because, you know, it, it's sort of, it would be a bit antisocial to be in a room with someone and have them vaping away. So I think we generally have the same sort of rules for e-cigarettes. We would have for normal cigarettes, i.e. please do it outside the building in a, in a sort of smoking zone um, and don't, don't cause a nuisance with it. But I think that's more around sort of consideration to other people and because other people don't necessarily, you know, they wouldn't necessarily it's very low risk of harm. And, you know, and it is also quite antisocial just doing it around people because it does create lots of vapour, even though it's not particularly harmful. And can I ask a, a supplementary to that? Yes, go ahead. Is, is there any evidence to suggest, because it, it's still nicotine, isn't it? As far as yeah. I know. Yeah. yeah. But um, uh, you know, causes of things like um, lung cancer and uh, um, other chest diseases, things like that, um, are caused by the e-cigarettes. E I don't know. So they do contain nicotine, but generally in normal cigarettes, it's not the nicotine that causes the cancer. It's the tar it's the and yeah, all yeah. the other sort of additives. Yeah. yeah. So e-cigarettes do contain sort of smaller amounts of particulate matter. They don't contain tar. They don't contain sort of formaldehyde type stuff. So, so there's a, there's a lot less in them, but they're not risk-free because we obviously haven't been using, they do have small amounts of things yeah. in them and we, yeah. we haven't had, people haven't been using them for long enough for us to know what the effect, the long-term effects are, but it's very likely that those effects will be a lot less than cigarettes because there is so much lower sort of load of toxins within them. Um, there's a link in this report, actually, I, I link to the, the COT report, um, which is the um, Committee on Tox Toxicity of Chemicals in Food Consumer Products and the Environment. Um, and so there's a link on page um, three, bottom of page three, um, and that will take you through to a report that's got very sort of technical detail on what the various, what the relative risks are of e-cigarettes e versus regular cigarettes. Because as you say, they do contain yeah. nicotine and, you know, nicotine is risky for particularly for pregnant women, it has a, it impacts birth weight and things like that. So you know there are particular groups for whom you wouldn't say you should be smoking an e-cigarette. You, you you know you wouldn't uh, necessarily recommend that. Thanks for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome, um, Councillor Noakes, and then Councillor Witham, and then Councillor Lamb, please. Chair, sure. uh, thank you for the report. Um, I just wondered. Um, so the, the the figures that are referred to in the report seem to indicate that e-cigarettes, uh, it says here, um, amongst the 886 participants, one-year abstinence uh, rates were 83% higher in the e-cigarette group, uh, which obviously is a lot, <laughs> it sounds like a lot. Um, and I just wondered, are we at the stage yet where e-cigarettes can be, can you get e-cigarettes on the NHS as a smoking cessation um, method, uh, or is that was that not been approved yet, or is that something that someone's looking at? Or? So that that trial was a, a pilot that was done in the City of London, where they were giving out e-cigarettes as part of their smoking cessation service. And we in Southwark are actually um, are just looking at doing that right now. So we are re in the process of recommissioning our smoking cessation service, and we are looking to include e-cigarettes as part of that offer because, as Nice says, it is really it is really it's a really effective way of getting people to quit, and they can choose that or they can choose patches or gum or, or, or Champix, which is a kind of medication which stops craving. So we're giving people as many options as possible so they can find the best method to help them quit because quitting is, you know, it's the single most important thing you can do for your health. And it disproportionately affects people from our sort of lower income groups and people with mental health issues and other disabilities. So it's really important that we tackle smoking in order to tackle health inequalities amongst our, our population. Sorry, just one quick follow-up question if I may, Chair. Okay. Um, and, and does, do, I mean, do we have, um, we have the right to do that sort of thing, do we? Or does that have to be, that does it have to be a national go ahead to say that this can happen? Or we, or we already have the powers to, to give out e-cigarettes if we wish to? We already have the powers to do that if we wish to. Okay. And there's no, there's no chance that we're going to, suddenly someone's going to find out that there's something dodgy in e-cigarettes and that people are going to sue us for uh, giving them. 
out. I, I think, mean, has anyone <laughs> looked at that or? <laughs> I think that would be very unlikely. Um, so the e-cigarettes are generally, they're highly regulated um, and they're generally considered to be, you know, a lot safer than cigarettes. Um, and it's already been done sort of in lots and lots of boroughs across London and across the rest of the UK. So we're, we're in no way sort of the, the, the front runners in, in doing this. It's, it's very much an established thing that's, that's, been, that's been happening over the last few years. Okay, thank you. C Councillor Wisdom, please. Yeah, we've, we've heard about um, e-cigarettes being used to quit smoking. Is there any evidence of anybody um, taking up smoking using vaping as a sort of gateway into that? There doesn't seem to be any. I know there's been sort of concerns about young people using it as a sort of gateway into, into vaping, but actually I think PHE did a quite recent survey with young people that showed that where young people use were vaping, it was because they smoked and then they were sort of trying both. Um, and th there's no evidence at all that it, it, it forms sort of gateway to smoking. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lam? Oh, thanks, Jen. Um, I think this probably we make um, some people creep a bit when I, when I say, you know, um, I hear people saying health inequality, which is also linked to, you know, there's no money in your pocket, no job and things like that. But to some people in the um, certain community, especially black community, they also see legislative inequality. Take for instance, when I walk on the road and I see people vaping, I feel uncomfortable. It, it, there's no difference to me whether the person is vaping or actually smoking real cigarette. I feel uncomfortable. And the same thing, the same way I feel when I see people smoking marijuana. But the difference is that one can easily get a um, criminal record for doing one, while the other gets free. Is there in future conversation about health and legislative inequality relating to the use of those two substances, especially those that are used by certain ethnic minorities, because the conversation we need to have in future. Um, I don't see any difference. I think both of them should be able to do well as they believe they want. But unfortunately at the moment, I think there's that legislative inequality we can put it that way. So in future, is there an opportunity to have that conversation? I know it's probably too big for us at the local level, but most of these conversations start from local level before it gets to national, international level. Thank you. I don't know if there's any comments from any of the members. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and thank you, um, Farah, for feedback and answering questions tonight. Um, do, if we go on to um, item nine, the scrutiny review, this is health inequalities BME young people. We've, um, if you scroll down, you'll see sort of the outline of what we said we were going to do in this, our next report. I wonder if members want to consider that and see if there's, given what we heard tonight, if we want to add anything or tweak anything to the scope of our next report, which is health inequalities for BME young people. Because we might be, you know, we may want to add a few things. I think that in terms of recommendations, I think we should look at the opportunities that um, the CAM team were talking about, um, CAMs were talking about in terms of um, increasing scope for um, increasing access of BME young people to the CAMs. I think we should use all that as recommendations because I think then we can we can get something to um, report back on and say, how far have you done this? I think also we need to add um, the ongoing work that Jeanette Grimes was saying she's doing in, in conjunction with Jeanette Laws about all the whole um, um, agency, uh, co-agency approach towards um, supporting young people. Um, I don't know if members have got any other ideas they want to add to the report, because I think we, we're in the process of having to draft it now. It, it won't be completed till probably after the election. Is there any other thing that people, because this was just a draft, scrutiny review proposal if members can report back to myself and julie trimble about if they want to add anything to the report and then we can start fleshing it out 
Which, uh, which document are you looking at at the moment? Well, I'm looking at agenda item nine. If you look down, it says scrutiny review proposal. What is the review? Can you see it? If you could scroll down. Yeah, that's, a, that's the, um, the sort of review proposal rather than the content. Is that what no, no that's what I'm saying. That's review proposal. So I'm just suggesting if there's anything people want to add to the proposal. Right. Because obviously we've heard from CAMS today, we've heard from Jeanette, we've heard from CAMS, um, Harold and his team about, and SLAM, sorry, but what they're suggesting, and I'm suggesting their opportunities, we should put that in as recommendations so we can scrutinise what they're doing, because it's all well and good having great opportunities in SLAM and CAMS, but we, we need to monitor and see, is it actually, you know, creating the increase in the uptake from BME young people? You know, of all the different health inequalities is what the work that Jeanette and Janet and everybody else is doing, is that reducing the health inequalities of BME young people? Yeah? Yeah. So I'm just suggesting to members that if they want to come back and want to add mm -hmm. something to that, if there's a community group that they feel that we need, we, we should be reaching out to. Um, obviously, I don't know about visits. It's a shame about COVID and lockdown. We could have done a lot of visits to different community groups. If there's a community group you feel that we should be engaging with, please let us know. Because I think it's important, you know, like the last the last meeting we did have, pen people be good to get um, other community groups involved. Um, yes, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. I I, I do wonder that uh, as we come out of the lockdown and we keep hearing all statistics about young people who will be losing their jobs um, and the effect it may or may not have upon their mental health, oh, yeah. that we may be inundated with uh, mental health um, uh, missions or queries or whatever that, that might put um, the health service in Southwark and Lambeth at great risk. Yeah. That's my, my concern. Um, okay. You know, so maybe that's something we, we could just sort of keep an eye on and monitor as yeah. the next few months um, yeah. come along. Definitely. I think d definitely if you can email that to Julie Trimble <clears> and myself, I think we need to add that definitely because because I think that's a really good point, Charlie, because we, we've been anticipated this time last year, we said, okay, we're going to have, you know, we're going to have wave number one, then second wave. But the point is that now it's been a year, literally a year to the day. In the next three to six months, what's going to happen with the lift of lockdown? You know, people have more opportunities, but like you were saying, the negative side from that, they've got no money, they've got no opportunities. A lot of them, if, you know, that, you know, they're missing the educational achievement and stuff like that, what's the impact on their mental health? And that's not just for six months, that's mental health for the next few years, isn't it? So I think maybe we need to add that to that about what's the impact of COVID on the young people. Is that exacerbated health inequalities for our young people? Has anybody else got a hand up? I'm just looking, I can't see. Okay. Sure, I think can, I just, can I just see oh, clarity sorry. in regards to when, I mean, when are we planning, what's the, the yes. plans of when are we submitting the um, recommendations? About what's the impact of COVID on the young people? Is that okay? Uh, something odd happened. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah uh, so uh, there is a plan to chair to have one final meeting, and um, we we did say that um, I think at the last meeting to circulate a headline report to um, <coughs> pen people and people. So um, is that I think is that still the intention? Sorry, I'm I'm on mute. I keep talking when I'm on mute. Um, that was the attention, but the point is, I think with Perda, are we allowed to even have a final meeting? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, we should be able okay. to have a final meeting. Yeah, as long as the um, as long as the recommendations don't touch on um, really contentious issues that relate to the GLA. Um, okay. But which I, I don't, don't think they will do. No, no, no. So, so you're fine there. You will yeah. be able to do a, a final report. Um, and complete this by this um, administrative year. Right. So, so do you think that we should have a final meeting next month just to talk about this report and nothing else? Because we can't really talk about the yeah. NHS and anything else, can we? No, no, no. You definitely couldn't cover the integrated um, integrated care system or anything else. And yeah, I think it would be wise to focus really on this report. That was the aim, really, because it's it's getting to the near uh, near the end of the administrative year. So yes, yeah, yeah. Really focus on. Um, so this report, so yes, this is a, I mean, obviously I've taken notes of the, yeah. all the recommendations that have come up here, yeah. use of the hands, the opportunity. I think we can also ask, there will be an opportunity to ask for that briefing from um, Jeanette Laws about yeah. how 
of the system is working in terms of okay. the multi-agency work. So we could we could integrate that hopefully within the report. Okay. Um, if Jeanette's able to do that in time. Um, so yes, yeah, so yeah. Okay. So so if we're going to do another final meeting, I think it's important to probably think of potential dates now so people can scope that in. The only thing is, I or would. What? Is that difficult? To, yeah, I mean, we could look at potential days. There is a bit of a risk, though, because sometimes you can find out that there's um, clashes in the diary. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. Okay, okay. But, if you come back to us, yeah. Meeting, yeah, I can get back to. It's usually customary to work with you and David, isn't it, to find a meeting? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then that could just be a short meeting, which just to focus on that. And then, yeah. and then obviously, I think after the election, I think make, as soon as possible, if we can try and have a meeting to discuss about the ICS, you know, integrated care system, because I think that's just that's just a recurring thing throughout this year that we haven't really dealt with. And unfortunately, we come to the tail end of this administration year, see if we can try and pin that down, because I think it's important that we can have an open and frank discussion with the CCG about that. As a yeah. commission, I don't know what other members think, but me personally, I think it's important we have some really concrete answers and responses from them and maybe invite Steve and um, KONP as well, because I think it's important that we do have that conversation. Um, um, Councillor Noakes? I'm just wondering, Chair, I mean, um, thinking about making best use of our time. So uh, mm -hmm. if we are going to have a meeting in April, I'm just wondering if we can we could at least have the, uh, some sort of paper on the, the current, a reminder of the current structures that exist under the CCG in the way that they're and, and the way that they're seeking to. I mean, is, is it not possible to have that without getting dragged into the ICS stuff or not? I mean, we might have to seek. Um, I don't know if uh, Sam is still here. Possibly not. But um, but I mean, if we, if we can have some sort of update paper on the current structures and the current engagement program, um, that might just help to inform our ICS discussion. After election, no. uh, if that's possible. okay, I see what you mean. I'd do that. Yeah. Um, I see what you mean. Um, Steve, you've got your hand yeah, up. I, I, I think that's a good point, Steve. I, I agree with Councillor Noakes, Chair. Thank you. I think that would be very useful. Is my understanding, but I think I think <clears throat> Sam will certainly be able to give you better information, and it's technical information rather than political information. Yeah. That they're going to be running committees in common, and one of the things that the CCG, from my attendance at, at the meeting last week was saying that the accountable officer Andrew Bland was clearly saying South, the South East London consortium now the South East London CCG is well ahead of the case because they've been running for a year yeah and I think our worry is it's likely that CCGs are going to melt away yeah. with uh, but that currently he said because the ICS structure has not been meeting our healthier southeast london it's called there there should be committees in common now and i think all that should be technical information and i think we certainly in KOMP would find it really valuable to have a clear statement from them about what is actually happening with these structures pending this white paper which is likely much as we don't want it to go ahead in its current format, it's likely to go ahead in its current format and yeah. the goalposts will yet again move. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. And thank you, if I may, to everybody for giving us time and attention this evening. Thanks a lot. No, you're welcome, Steve. I think I pick up from Steve and obviously um, Councillor Noakes, I think that is a good thing that to pin them down and say, look, we do want information on these structures. Yes, you can't answer today, but we want that information. Because when we've got that information, then we can clearly stop and picking it and say, well, okay, what does that actually mean? So then when it comes to a meeting after post um, election, we can say, well, this is a concern. We have a scrutiny commission. You can actually answer it now because you're not you're not under purdue anymore. Also, the, uh, Sam did say that there was a presentation which I've seen about um, about the integrated care systems um, and work on integration. So I can send that around. Um, okay. And I think if it's um, yeah, I think you. I think you and I can publish that as well. I don't think there's any anything preventing that. Um, and I think on partnerships as well. I think um, I don't think that was, from my understanding, and I can check with officers. Yeah. Um, that can be covered as well um, because that's not part it of the be. care system, and that's not part of the. Uh, it's not the politically contentious aspect. So uh, I mean, I'll double check, but I would have thought okay. you could return to that. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so so if right, so in moving ahead, oh, we're going to say that Julie, you're going to get back to myself and David suggested um, dates in April, yeah. and then yeah. and then we can say it, and in that meeting, this is the clear agenda because only going to be a couple of items, isn't it really? Yeah. So it's fle flesh out. <clears throat> To flesh out the health inequalities um, report, but then also to look at, to, to probably discuss the I, ICS in more detail, because now we've got the paper, we can, we can discuss that in more detail in terms of the scrutiny commission in order to present some questions back to Sam and her team in post-election, yeah? Well, I think, um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you definitely, I think what, what you could, I mean, I'll get confirmation of this, what you, yeah. you can have a look at the paper in terms of the ICS, Okay. And I think if you wanted, um, if you wanted any more information, um, that might be something that you could ask to come to in the meeting after the election. The election, that's what I was saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, um, and then I think partnership Southwark, that could well be something that you could have on the agenda. Um, okay. Because that's the, and so local structures, and I think you wanted to particularly cover engagement. Was that, is that right? Yeah. I think. Yeah. Council Notes said that, and the structures of Partnership Southwark. So I think that would be fine to have on the agenda for next time. I think what would be the and and I can send around the information. I think the more problematic thing is if um, is waiting the bit about um, having a conversation or discussion with NHS colleagues on the ICS. That's a bit yeah. that would have to wait until after wait till after election. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, I think that's, I think if there's nothing else, I think that's it for this evening. I don't know if I've gone through the whole agenda. Um, and I think in terms of the work programme, we didn't discuss any open items at the beginning. I think in terms of work programme, we can just probably discuss that in the next meeting saying what we do. Yeah. I'm looking well, at you, you're looking at me bewildered. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 that's fine. Yeah, yeah. so, so the, I think the work programme is just to note things like, um, that we're going to have a follow-up meeting and then to yeah. put the two items on the agenda. So you've covered that already. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If there's nothing else, thank you everybody for your attendance tonight. And hopefully we'll see you at a meeting next month. Okay. Thank you very thank much, you. Chair. Good night. Thank everybody. you. Good night, everybody. Thank nice you for coming to see you, Charlie. See you else. Take care. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.